Well, it is quarter after, and I am nothing if not habitually punctual, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. I'll start us off opening in prayer, if that's okay. God, we thank you so much for this morning, for the chance for us to gather together, to take one last week to look through this book on how people change, to wrap up our time together on this topic, to recap what we've learned so far, to discuss together the impact it's had on our life, God. And I pray for those of us that are here, those of us that are on their way, that we would be preparing our hearts not only for a time of fellowship this morning, but for a time of worship, a time of gathering together as your body of Christ, that our hearts would be ready for the sermon that's going to be preached, and that it would be all about your business today, God. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, last week, Isaac did a pretty good job of wrapping up the book as we've looked at it so far. It's, well, I shouldn't say a pretty good job. He did a great job of wrapping the book up as we've looked at it so far. And since we've kind of covered all the topics in the book, for people who have been reading along with the book, you may have noticed that this last chapter is really kind of a case study of this one church. And I didn't think it would be incredibly helpful for us to walk through a case study of another church that's not too much like us, that doesn't have a lot in common with us. So I thought it would be good for us to take one week, and just kind of recap the things of the book and apply them a little bit more personally to our lives. When I when Actually, the first pastor that Sherry and I had together when we were married was a, was a great guy, and he finished every sermon that he preached with, so what? That was, his, that was his concluding point. It was his way of kind of saying, what was the point of this? You guys all came here for a Sunday and listened to me preach for you know 45 minutes. So, so what? What's supposed to be different about your life from this? And so I would like to start with that as our first point. We've spent 16 weeks diving into how people change. So what? So, so what has this done for you in your life? And I have, uh, you may remember, I often have pages of notes left over when I've taught in the past. Today, if nobody talks, we're going to wrap up really quickly because this is going to be a lot more collaborative than normal. So I want to start by asking you, what has this done in your life? How, how has this changed your life? We, we have spent 16 weeks together reading chapters, planning ahead, writing notes, studying in advance, or if nothing else, just showing up and listening to one of us talk for 45 minutes, what has resonated with you from this book so far? No matter how long you've been a Christian, there will always be a need for change. No matter how long you've been a Christian, there will always be a need for change. That's a nice reminder. Yeah. And that's a nice reminder. Does that feel like a nice reminder to everybody? <laughs> <laughs> A needful reminder, for sure. How do you feel about the fact that you will never be done changing? Honestly, it makes me feel a little bit better about where I am right now. Makes you feel a little better about where you are now? That's that's fair. You're not you're not supposed to be perfect yet. Doesn't matter if you're in your twenties, your thirties, your fifties, your eighties. You're not supposed to be perfect yet. That's nice. What? stuck with you the most in your life. I don't, I'm not asking for anything too deep, unless anybody wants to go deep, but hopefully as we've read through this book, things have come to your mind. This is something that I didn't expect to be confronted by, by God, by this book. Has anything really caught you off guard as we've read through this about the things that God is working on you to change in your life? Yeah. Um, yes, we know it's still that sin. But we've also been given a new heart. Right. And, and am I really striving to, to live out of that new heart? Or do I kind of just kind of fall back? Yeah, I won't do that. All. My heart's desperately wicked. <laughs> My heart's desperately wicked, anyways. I just, you know.
Yeah, that's really interesting because what you're kind of alluding to is the flip side of what Sherry said, which is, you know, we've always got something to change. And, you know, Jared was like, that makes me feel better because I shouldn't be there yet. But in some ways, we don't want to say, well, I've always got change coming. So it doesn't matter if I ever make headway. That's, that's where we shouldn't land, right? Because if we're always supposed to be changing, you know, sometimes it's a learning curve, but it shouldn't always be a learning loop. You know, there's times where I think I'm on a learning loop. I learned the, I gotta learn the same lesson five or six times to really get it. But everything in our life shouldn't be that way. We should move on from some things. We should be able to look back and say, yeah, I was there and I'm not there anymore. And I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not in heaven yet. I'm not, I'm not righteous except for the righteousness imparted by Christ, but I'm, I'm better. I have been able to let some things go. And that can be both, just like we said, the fact that we always need change can be both encouraging and a little frustrating. <laughs> so it's a good question, John. So should the word be change or maturing? What's the difference between those words to you, John? Right, so that was that was a little different topic specifically because what he is saying is they hadn't grown spiritually mature, which is on the same topic of change. How would you how would you define those as different? Uh, there's sanctification. There's uh, increasing knowledge of the Lord, which should cause us to change because we see our sin more than we did before. Yeah. So there's sanctification. This is one of the things I like about this topic because there's all these words, and some of them are very churchy words. Like if you're, if you're not a regular church attender, you might not have heard the word sanctification before. So around the world we say, well, you know, we're, we're trying to grow in sanctification. Someone might say, yeah, it's a, it's a $5 word, and you're having a $1 conversation here. Like I just, <laughs> that's not a word for me. And so when we say sanctification, we becoming more sanctified, more holy, more like Christ, and change is wrapped up in that. And maturity might mean growing in spiritual maturity, knowledge, growing in knowledge, and all of those are related. But those are, I think, related topics to change. But when we're talking about change, particularly from this book, we're talking about change in the way that we respond. Because there's a change could be a very broad topic. And this book is specifically talking about change in the way we respond to what the book calls heat. And it refers to it both as heat and dew, these external circumstances that come in and our heart responds. And because our heart responds, our body responds negatively. And we want to get rid of that when somebody, you know, cuts me off on the highway. I was with my son, William, yesterday, and he was saying, you know, I am basically a patient person. And I'm, I'm pretty happy with my patience until I get in my car. <laughs> And we were, we were going south on Hamilton, and if you guys know Hamilton near the airport, that's a 50-mile-per-hour road, and we were stopped at a light, and we pulled away, and the guy who was in front of William was pulling away at a, at a pace that was not the pace William wanted to pull away with, and, he, you know, and that's when he said that. And I think we all, I think that resonates with all of us, that there are these things that just, to use a modern term, trigger us, that we think, well, this is just intolerable, and so I'm going to do something about it, and I'm going to... And, and I have been that guy many times in my life where I was going to set right this wrong, this perceived wrong against me, this perceived wrong in the world. And so all those things that you talk about, John, that maturity, that growth in knowledge, that growth in sanctification, how do those impact us as we're trying to change our heart response and eventually our action response to these outside influences? So the heat is there for discipline. But not for the heat is also there to filter out those who are unsaved to say, you know what, I do believe that God loves me. You know, I'm not suppressing my interest, but it might be a question of salvation. So that, that you, you said a lot of interesting things there. So what John said, I'm, I'm going to let us pull this apart because I want this to be interactive. I want us to think about these things because it's really easy to spend a lot of time going through a book and then you put the book on the shelf and you don't, that's why I started this with so what? Like, well, like so what? So how is my life different because we've spent six weeks, 16 weeks together reading this book? So John said the heat is there for discipline. What do you think about that? Somebody respond to that. Right? 
So you want to be more disciplined. So we are sometimes disciplined. And I, I would like us to think a little bit about, do we consider the source of heat when we consider how we're going to respond to it? And we could both say, yes, I do, and that affects how I respond because I'm wise about it, or yes, I do because I want to know where I'm allowed to go off the rails and when I'm not, or like we could consider it for both good and poor reasons. And Yeah. So that is, and sometimes he's doing that because he's also pointing out that, hey, I'm trying to touch this area in your life that's not like me. I'm not necessarily like spanking you or disciplining you. Right. Right, because we know God will not tempt us. The Bible's clear about that. God, is, Sometimes that heat that comes in is temptation. Sometimes we talked about that heat is really more like dew. It's a blessing that comes in that can, I mean, sometimes we're more easily derailed by blessings than we are by adversity. It's, it's surprisingly easy to, to distract us with shiny things. We're like kittens sometimes, you know, it's just a little, little shiny thing and we get easily distracted away from the Lord. Right, and so one of the things you're alluding to is sometimes these adversities come into our life, regardless of their source, when we've learned to respond properly, as we grow in that, and this is kind of what Cam was talking about, as we discipline ourselves, we can then get better at helping others who go through a similar thing. And I know oftentimes in the middle of that adversity, it, that, that is a, not a justifiable reason to feel like we have to go through adversity just so we can help somebody else go through a similar adversity. But that can be helpful. So what, so what do you think of that? G give me some feedback on that. How do we respond differently, or do we respond differently, when we evaluate the source of this heat in our life? Give me some examples of source of heat in our life. So, so we can be a source of heat in our own life. Some of these are easy. This, this, is, not a, this is not a trick question. What, often what? Often we are. We, we are. Often there, which, often it's our own <laughs> self. We blame the person that made it not the right way. Well, so yeah. certainly the reason we respond is always on us. That's one of the things that this book is clear about and that we should be clear about as Christians. There is no, the devil made me do it. There is no, well, because of he, that woman you gave me, <laughs> none of those excuses justify our actions as being okay. But there is still sometimes somebody else, right? There's another person that has come into our life and stolen our lunch at work or cut us off on the highway or, or much more seriously and realistically and significantly wronged us. And that's, it's okay to acknowledge that. It could be Satan. And as we talked about, God will even at times discipline us. And we can see that as a source of heat, to use the book's terms. We can see that as something that can drive us to act wrongly that, that can cause our heart to turn away that i mean there's the bible is full of examples like that you know most notably jonah is a good example god brings him something to do he sees it as a source of adversity and he spends the next several chapters running further down further lower further south so well and that's a complicated question and we're not going to get too far off on the rails between whether God allows or causes it. But do we respond differently 
when we look at the source of that heat? And should we? Sherry said, I think so, but you were starting to say more, so I'll let you. <laughs> And so if it's self-inflicted as opposed to external, when you see something going on around you, how do you respond differently to those? So there's always a turning aspect when you see your heart responding wrongly. And this is some, some of this is just straight out of the book, but I want us to think about it in our own context. So can somebody give me an example of something in your life that over the last 16 weeks or in your past that you have seen God come to you and you can say, this is a self-inflicted wound. This is something you're doing to you. And how have you either poorly in the past or better in the last 16 weeks responded to that? or even better in the past? Um, I think just in general, I have a tendency to get frustrated at work. Um, I feel like people should know when the work do things a certain way. Uh, and when they don't, I get angry and annoyed. And I think, um, not that I don't still do it, <laughs> So that's a, that's a good example. I think that's one that we can all kind of identify with. We have all been in or are in a workplace where everybody doesn't treat us as graciously as we feel we deserve. That's probably a given. <laughs> I don't know that anybody works at a company with customers in an environment where everybody is always as gracious as you'd like them to be. Whether it's a coworker or a customer, we're all going to struggle with that. And what is going on in our hearts? Because what, a lot of what Jared talked about, and I appreciate your openness, is about how we're responding. But one of the things this book wants us to talk about a little bit more is what's at the heart of that issue. So when we're struggling with somebody at work, whether it's a customer or a coworker, and things aren't going the way we want them to, what is the struggle internal? Well, you know, when we're talking about heart, the heat is the, is the, you know, my coworker has stolen my lunch again, and I've tried to make it extra spicy so I can find them because they'll be the ones panting in the kitchen, rubbing their tongue with a paper towel, but they obviously like spicy foods and this isn't working. So when that's going awry, what's going on in our heart? When we're thinking, well, maybe I'll poison it next. And <laughs> So we definitely have a lack of grace, lack of forgiveness, but what is it that I want? What is the thing that's wrong in my heart? What do I want? Justice. justice. We, well, we, and this is one of those things, right? We've talked about this a lot. We always want justice for other people, right? We want everybody else to get their justice. But we very seldom want justice for ourselves, right? We, just, we want grace for us and justice for others. And why do we feel like we're being wrong? I mean, this is a simple one, right? We made the lunch. We brought the lunch. Like, you're stealing from me. You're taking this thing that I made, and I, I made it, so I deserve it. And it, it's a reasonable thing to want. It's a reasonable thing to want my items to be secure. I brought a thing that I made for lunch. I mean, this is a trivial issue, right? Somebody's stealing my lunch. 
I don't think any of us would be enraged if somebody asked us for lunch. If we saw somebody hungry, we would be glad to feed them. But when we, when we get our things taken, when things don't go the way we expect them to go, our hearts get riled up about this. And that's the whole point of this book, is that we have to look deeper inside. I think our initial response is to say, as we've all said in this conversation, well, this is how I'm responding, and this is how I should respond. I know I'm not being gracious, and I need to be gracious. When somebody cuts me off on the road, I know I'm not being patient as I whip around them, and I should be more patient as I whip around them. And so we're, we're not, we know we need to change our attitude, and sometimes we might actually change our attitude, but, but our behaviors might need to change, and sometimes we might actually change our behaviors. But the heart inside, the thing that says, well, I was sovereignly traveling on my way down this road, and you've made me slow down or change lanes. And this has annoyed me to the point where I've had to, you know, one of the things Sherry and I have often talked about is just having to turn your cruise control off when you're in the far left-hand lane, you're just going along. Somebody's in the left-hand lane going under the speed limit, and you're like, my cruise control is just set. Come on. If you're not going to be going the speed limit, move over. I don't, the, the act of having to tap my brakes and turn off the cruise control sometimes seems like an affront beyond bearing. And it's, it obviously isn't. It's not that big of a deal. But the things that can cause our hearts to just get angry are surprising. And sometimes they're significant things. Sometimes people are truly wronged. It's, it's not like the world is not full of true affronts, true adversity, true wrongs, true hurts. But when we're struggling with the small ones, it gets so hard to get better at the big ones. And I think we need to look inside our heart and say, well, what is the thing that I'm, what is, what is my sovereignty as if I am? What is my sovereignty being challenged? Is, is my right to respect being challenged? Is my, my identity being challenged? Are you telling me you can't be this, you have to be that being challenged? Is my, and, and yeah, Jared. Right. And he calls me to give it to them. And I think if I thought about that more, it might help. So Jared said something interesting there, and I want us to talk about this, pull it apart a little bit. I, again, Jared is always very gracious to share, and I, I, I'm not saying what he said was wrong, but I want us to think about it because I think there's a truth there that's very important, that I have no inherent value apart from God. Do you agree with that? Yeah, apart from God, if, you know, we've often talked, I, I go to another Bible study and we often talk, theoreticals when it comes to God are, are useless. Well, God could, well, God only did what God did, and God did the things he did, but if there were no God, we would have no value, is an interesting statement. There is a God, so the theoretical almost doesn't matter, but apart from God, we have no value is an interesting sentence. I think it's actually true. I think what Jared said was right. As long as you add that apart from God, if you mean literally, without a God, we would have no value. That's true, because God gives value to everything in the universe. But do we believe that? And I think that's the tricky one, because I think what Jared said was very wise, because I think we don't often believe it. If we think my value, everybody's value, is inherited value from God as a part of his creation, as in our case, a created in the image of, as image bearers of God, that is where our value comes from. Do we really believe that our value, as everybody else's value, comes from God? I'm more valuable than that person here, right now, because, because I brought the lunch and you stole the lunch. I'm more valuable than God, in God's eyes than you are. <laughs> the order, the order, the order, the order, the order. Don't you know we're busy? You know? And it's sort of 
It's chicken and sandwiches. How hard is it? <laughs> God has left a scene in my life. I've stopped considering this interaction as divinely ordained for me to be a blessing to this person in whatever way God has ordained in this moment. To get their order and take them a chicken sandwich and be kind and gentle to them or to graciously show them the menu or to be patient and wait behind them because I don't know what they're going through and they might be struggling and me cutting them off might be much worse than them cutting me off because I'm just fine. I'm really just fine. I'm, it's okay. If I don't make it to work 45 seconds faster, it'll be okay. If, if I don't get to Chick-fil-A in the next 30 seconds, it'll be all right. I, st- they won't run out of chicken sandwiches. It's okay. You can cut me off. And I think we do that all the time. We don't see other people as equally value in the image of God. Yes, Holly, from the, from the balcony. both sides of that spectrum. I'm really glad you brought that up. How does our heart, re- and so what Holly said is that sometimes we struggle because we're feeling sovereign and we're the main character and we are prideful. And sometimes we struggle because we don't see our value as inherently given to us by God and that makes us valuable. We see our value as having to be earned and so we undervalue ourselves. How do our heart res- hearts respond in that instance? What are we likely to do in an instance like that where we're where we're denigrating ourselves, where we're devaluing ourselves. I think we're all comfortable with saying, well, when somebody interferes with my sovereignty, I get angry. When they've insulted my right to sovereignly ordain the facts of my life, I can get angry and antagonistic and I can start getting angry with them. When we start devaluing ourselves, not overvaluing ourselves inherently, how do our hearts respond? Yeah, Ricky. <laughs> ruin my life because now I can't earn my now place. I can't do that well. Now I look bad. And I think too, I mean, you, you know, being God has always been my thing. If I know, I mean, God has told me that I'm God. He has told me that I am. I am because of Him. Right. We have. So when I lose that perspective, I've lost my vision of who he says I am. I think one of the things, I think Ricky's sort of close to what I think a lot of people struggle with, is that we can still get angry, but I think what happens is we get angry at us. When we start to devalue ourselves, we start, that hatred that we can have for other people will turn in on us. Well, I, I know God says I'm created in him as image, but I've, I've screwed this up again. I've sped again. I've stolen again. I've I've been lazy again. I've let this go again. I've failed this way again. We start to devalue, and then we get mad at us. And that anger that turns outward that's so dangerous in this world where we start hating other people for the things they do that insult my sovereignty, when we turn that inward, that's just as dangerous. It's just a little harder to see. I'm worthless. I'm not good for anything. And then we start, you know, when we get angry with the world, we start facing out a lot more. We start, get, we start engaging in very unhelpful ways. But when we turn inward, when that anger turns inward on us, I think we start engaging in very helpful, unhelpful ways inward, but we don't engage outward. 
we start to withdraw. And that's where it gets really dangerous because that same anger, that same heart response that says, well, this has happened and I'm going to be this way about it. I'm going to be frustrated. I'm going to be angry, but I get angry with me. I get angry with myself and that turns inward. And then we start pulling back from church. We don't start engaging more. We don't start going out more. We start turning in more. And I think that can be equally dangerous because we don't see ourselves as created in God's image. We don't get that value from there. And I think that's one of those things that people who struggle one side or the other tend not to see the danger of the other side. They tend not to realize that I can also undervalue myself. When we're driving down the highway and somebody cuts us off, we're overvaluing ourselves. We're elevating our worth to say, I'm, I'm like the king. You're not allowed to get in the way of the king when he's riding through town. You've got to step to the side and bow. Well, we're, we start to feel like that way about ourselves when we're driving down the road. When you cut me off, when you slow me down, you're interfering with my sovereignty. But there are people who struggle on the other side too, where they undervalue themselves. Anytime something goes wrong, they think it's their fault. They revile themselves. They hate themselves. And that's just as dangerous. Does anybody know an example of where that's happened? Can anybody share an example? I've known several people that are either drug users or, or alcoholics, and that, I mean, that fits right in on them. They know that they're doing wrong when they're drinking an alcohol or shooting up cocaine or whatever it is they're doing. But in order to get over that, they do more to sort of make themselves not feel better but not have any feelings at all. So. Yeah. I mean, what my dad Bill was saying is that drug use falls right into that. You fall into a sin, you hate yourself for the sin, you have no way to overcome it on your own, so you fall into the sin more. It becomes this downward spiral. And that same downward direction is the same direction we head when we're elevating ourselves. We're just, we feel like we're getting better, but we're not. We feel like we're self-aggrandizing even more and more. And, and the world encourages that. The world encourages a pull yourself up by your own bootstraps mentality, which is a silly analogy because that's literally the only thing you can't do with bootstraps is pick yourself up with them. Yeah, John. Some people just say the world encourages uh, the opposite too. Is people love seeking identification. And I identify with Christ. If I see myself worthless in Christ, I'll find worth other places. Or the world will tell me I have worth other places. I'll start to not know who I am. So I'll seek to find out who I am. Yeah. Uh, the world uh, loves putting me in any box that it can put me in. Yeah. An identification culture, you know. So in both extremes, this is a good transition, John. Is our focus on Christ or is our focus on ourselves? So 16 weeks in, now what do we do? We, we've read this book for 16 weeks. We're closing the chapter on this one. We'll talk a little bit about the next book we're going to do. What do we do now? How do we take this book and not just stick it on our shelves and say, well, that was a good book. I'll tuck it away for some time later in my life when I might struggle with a bad heart response and I can go pull it out then. Like, how do, we, how do we take this book and actually make this not one of the books we did in ABF, and that was a good one, and I, I appreciated the time, and thanks everybody for teaching, but how do we, how do we actually be people who want change? My, my, job, my, my job is an interesting one because I, we build software for people and then everything about their job changes. We, we change the way their process works, we change the way their input data, the way they print reports, and, and we are not always perceived as the good guys when we come in. Somebody likes what we're bringing, but a lot of other people often have to change what they do. How do we get to be the people who like change, that want change, that desire to change for the sake of the gospel? How do we get people to be people who revile the things in us that our heart does wrong while still valuing ourselves as created in God's image? Constantly reading and meditating on Scripture. Yeah. Um, we practice it. We practice it. And I had an awesome opportunity yesterday. I had a really difficult run-in with um, with somebody, and I was really hurt and really angry, um, and that came out in my actions. And I was like, as I was recounting it to Matt, I was sharing like how mad I was at that person and how they spoke to me and how they treated me in that moment. 
and I, uh, and I'm, like, my reaction was because the, how they acted towards me, and then I had hours to reflect on it, and I was appreciating this book so much in that moment because I was sitting there thinking, that was my sin. Like, I reacted the way that I did because that was the sin in my heart, and somebody was making, somebody was acting in a way that actually ended up being a blessing in the end. It ended up showing me a, an area of my sin that I needed to go after, that I needed to attack, and it prompted an opportunity for repentance. Um, you know, I also wanted an apology, but I was telling Matt, I cannot go into this conversation expecting an apology. I have to know that my sin is my sin, and I don't have to respond to Keith the way that I did. Yeah. My response to that Keith can bear good fruit, actually. It can show tenderness and gentleness and love, and I can have a really good listening ear, even while I'm being told things that I don't believe to be true. But I, it was a moment of yeah. joy. This person, it was just fun to yeah. say to myself, this person did not make me do what I'm doing right now. What I just did, the way I acted, yeah. was my sin, and I wanted to blame the moment. And historically, I would have blamed the person, blamed the moment, and not realized, like, that's actually what was in my heart. Yeah. To that's just lay down the law in that moment and show that I'm in charge, mm. and I, I'm not the way you say. Yeah. <laughs> to defend ourselves. Yeah. I mean, and... And it's not always wrong to want to defend yourself. But it should be because you're defending truth, yeah. not because you're defending yourself. And also in love. In love, it, it right. Come out in sin. Right. But if you're defending truth, not yourself, if it's God's sovereignty that's being challenged, not yours, you can be gracious because you can remember God doesn't need you to defend him. God's, God's fine. He's okay. He, he's not going to get sad and frustrated because this person doesn't believe in him, so he's going to devalue himself. He's sad for them because he knows they're wrong. He, they, they're missing an opportunity to be in fellowship with him. Yeah. And, I, and I should say, too, it ended really well. Not because the situation magically went away, but through repentance, following the patterns of the book, humbling myself and seeing my bad reaction, I was able to, in that moment, and That's it great. Truly ended that way. Like it ended peacefully. I was praising God, and I feel like now we can move forward. And and I I have said this my sin. It's on the table. I'm calling it out. I don't want to respond that way anymore. So now there's accountability. Now there's kind of even to this person that you're yes. kind of in conflict with. Yes, exactly. It was incredible. And That's great. And that that kind of thing is so encouraging to those of us that teach because. We and one of the things we've kind of talked about. I was at a Bible study with Andrew yesterday, actually, and he said something really clever. I think that we've talked about a lot. A lot of the Christian walk is about kind of holding two dichotomies in hand at once. It's it's not like these things are in conflict, but you really have to walk a narrow line between undervaluing yourself and overvaluing yourself. And there's this: yes, we are sinners, but we are saved by grace. We are unrighteous but we have the righteousness of Christ. And trying to stay in the middle is so tricky. And practicing, like you said, you're not going to get great at the big things. This is what John was alluding to when he says we have to spend time meditating in the Word. You're not going to get good at the really hard things. There are very serious affronts in this world. There are people who have had atrocities committed against them. And you're not going to be good at those right out of the gate. God, God can divinely give peace beyond all understanding for any circumstance. But he also expects us to diligently work in the day-to-day, -day, in the, as Jared alluded, the minor conflicts over chicken sandwich ordering. It's, it's not the, it's not the be-all, end-all of the world, but it can really derail our hearts. And even the small things can become big things if we let them become God for us. If we're going to sin to get it, if we're going to sin when we don't get it, all those things we've talked about. And so... Um, 
I really want us to think as we're out in the world, I, I would really I would really hope and pray that we would all, myself, Isaac, Kevin, who taught this, we all need to focus on how am I responding and what is my heart saying about that? I'm not responding, you know, the Bible is full of examples of people saying, well, you know, right from the beginning in the garden, Adam says, that woman you gave me, you know, Eve says, well, that snake said, you know, I mean, they're all mad at somebody but themselves, and it's so rare where somebody just says, yeah, you're right, you got me. You know, you know. every once in a while you see somebody do that. David, when he was confronted with his sin, he kind of was like, oof, <laughs> right? He's, you know, he would, he'd sinned against Bathsheba, he'd had her husband killed, he'd taken her, and Nathan the prophet comes and says, I've got this story for you about this guy who stole the sheep, and David's all mad. He's like, that guy, we should get that guy. And he's like, well, that was you, David, and that, that sheep was your wife, and he's like, oof, <laughs> And I think he did realize there, you know, like every once in a while God confronts us, but we have to be on the alert. We have to guard our hearts. This is what it means when the Bible tells us to guard our hearts. I think sometimes we think when we have to guard our hearts, it's like our heart is a precious treasure that Satan is coming for. We got to guard it. We got to keep our heart safe. You know, like we're guarding it like a, a bank vault guard. Well, really, I think that verse is talking more about guarding your hearts like a prison guard. Our, guard is wick our heart is wicked and prone to wander. We've got, we've got to guard it. We've got to make sure it doesn't get out, that, that things don't get let out that are dangerous to the world around us and dangerous to us. Like our heart will convince us to sin against people at the drop of a hat over serious offenses and over traffic and chicken sandwiches. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that example a lot, Jared, because it is both important. Don't get me wrong, chicken sandwiches matter, but you know it's, it's not the most important thing. We've got a couple minutes left. I want to wrap up. I was going to have... I, I did have three points, you know, kind of, so what, now what, and my last point was just going to be, what? Like, if anybody had any questions, if anybody has anything that they just kind of had left unresolved, we've got a couple minutes, if anybody thinks, you know, we've been through 16 weeks of this, but I, I just still don't get this. Like, this just still doesn't resonate with me. I can't quite reconcile this. All three people who taught are here, I, I, I've done a lot of tech conferences where I speak in front of a large group of people, and we I will often wrap up with a round of what I call stump the chump. Like I've been up here talking officially about something for a while now. So if you've got any tough questions, like let them out. That's not what we're doing here. I don't have all the answers. <laughs> I am not the subject matter expert here. So if you want to try and stump me, you will. Trust me, I am, I am very stumpable. But maybe together, if we have an outstanding question, we can answer it together. If there's anything that people really wish. I'd like to get an answer for this. And that's fine if not. This is not one where I'm just going to wait till somebody comes up with something. Because that's okay. The book still exists and we're all going to be here together, living life together in community for a long time, hopefully. So we'll, we, can, we can have each other's backs, even if it's not in the next minute and a half. Well, that's going to wrap up our study on how people change. I really hope we keep changing. I, I'm, I was very encouraged. If you've been to a lot of churches, if you've visited churches, most churches have some kind of pillar system. These are the things that are important to us. And every church that I've ever seen that takes the gospel seriously has gospel, some form of version, like we take the gospel seriously. And they have community. Like we care about one another. We have mission. We want to go out there and share the gospel. But change in your pillars is a little less common. And I'm really glad that we as a church have decided that change matters to us. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a question so much as I have. Well, then never mind. <laughs> like the Israelites in the first 500 pages of the Bible, 700 pages of the Bible, remember is, I don't know how many times, I'd love to do a word study, how many times is remember said in, in Hebrew uh, in the first part of the Bible a million times, so. but we forget, we lose sight, we shrink our vision, and so the one helpful thing I've, it came to me at some point to ask, and it, it helps me remember, to keep this perspective is like my heart my struggle with sin is sort of like holding my arm out and my sin is a weight ball, right? 
And just like any exercise, I think as we are Christians coming to faith, it's a big ball. We have a lot of sin we commit every day. We will always have sin in this life. In sanctification, the ball gets smaller. And by the grace of God, our arm gets stronger. But just like in any exercise, we fail. And I think in this life, those two things will happen, but we will fail. Yep. And when the end comes, we will no longer have to hold anything up. And that's sort of like my a picture that's just helped me remember like guard your heart like the sin is there you need to hold it gravity is pulling you down it's always trying to fail you know and it's it's just a constant effort to fight there you go all right well the next book we're going to be doing is a book called true worshipers we're going to be doing so we kind of cycle through and we're going to be talking about worship for the next book the book is true worshipers by bob coughlin and i really like the there's a quote on the back that says, the question is not, are you a worshiper? But rather, what kind of worshiper are you? And I think there's two truths in that. One, we are all going to worship something. Even if we're not Christians, we're worshiping something. But also inherent in that is that while we should be worshiping God as Christians, how are we worshiping God? How are we going about our worship for, you know, towards God? Is, is worship what we do Sunday morning in the first four songs before the service starts and in the last two songs afterwards? Or is worship something broader than that? Is worship more than just the, the six songs I sing a week on Sunday? Or is, is worship more than the music? And spoiler alert, the answer is yes, worship is more than the music. But we'll dive into that next. There's books up here. There's books up in the, the I think we call it the library, the book loft, the, that upper room kind of between the fellowship hall and the stairs. So... Grab one. I think we asked for $10 if you want to chip in. There's a basket up there. But please, if you need a book and you don't have $10, take one. And we, we don't want anybody to go without a book just because they didn't have $10 this week. So let me pray for us to close this up and we'll move into service. God, we thank you so much for this time. I am, I am truly grateful, God, that I am a part of a church of people who will come Sunday morning early, share their lives, to share their victories and their struggles. God, this is what it means to, to grow in community. This is what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. And I'm so glad I'm a part of the body of God, as the song says. God, we're thankful for what you're doing in our church, what you're doing in our lives. God, I pray for all of us that are here, that come today, that you would be about a work through your gospel in our hearts, that we would be committed greater to you today, that we would love you deeper today because of the time we spent with you and with one another, God, that our hearts would truly worship you this morning, not only as we sing, but as we listen, as we hear, as we talk to one another, as we serve one another, and that all we do would be an act of worship for you, God. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.